and I am really pleased to be here today with my first review for my ABC challenge. If you're curious about my ABC challenge and you want to know more about it, I will link all of the details up here or possibly up here and I will definitely link them down below. Today's book just so happens to be the first book on my bookshelf, the letter A, and one of the books that I have owned the longest on that shelf. So I am pretty pleased that it ticks off all of my requisite boxes. Before I jump right into the review on each of these videos, I'm going to give you an idea of where I first heard about this book, why it's on my bookshelf, why I've kept it for so long, haven't read it, etc. So I heard about this one along with most of you I imagine in 2014 when Mercedes from Mercy's Bookish Musings had her first Southern Literature Month and absolutely raved about this one and I pretty much had to pick it up straight away and from my records it turns out that I did. I picked it up at the end of March 2014 which means that I have had this book on my shelf for longer than three years. And I don't really understand why because a few months before Mercy mentioned this book I had just read a book called Tiger Tiger by Margot Fragoso which is about a similar sort of childhood. You'll see what I mean when I get into the review although it isn't set in the south and I was really really in the mood for this when I bought it. I think this one was maybe another one of those keep it for a rainy day book. So yeah I'm so pleased that I have finally read it because it has turned into a new favourite of mine. How would I sum up a bastard out of Carolina in one word? Oofed. It's a good, it's a good Scottish phrase for you. I'll, I'll put that here. Oofed. So I'm just going to throw it out there right now and give you guys a content warning for this one. I normally wouldn't put any kind of trigger warnings in any of my reviews or wrap ups. Again, that's a discussion for another video. But this one, it really is on the rip your skin off side of brutal truthfulness. And I feel obliged to give you guys a content warning for emotional and physical domestic violence and also for emotional, physical and sexual child abuse. If you are at all sensitive to either of those themes, I would just give this book a hard pass right now because I struggled reading this one in some parts and I don't struggle with any book really after reading so much crime and thriller fiction where topics like this are kind of your bread and butter. So just keep that in mind. But here comes the part where I convince any doubters who don't mind those subjects to read it anyway. Bastard Out of Carolina follows the fate of Ruth Ann Boatwright, otherwise known to her family as Bone. Bone was born illegitimately into a single parent household and she finds herself from a very, very early age questioning her belonging. The boat rights have been around for many generations in this area of the South, but they are very poor and they have always been very poor. And so there are definitely times when trailer trash is bandied about as a term. And so that is a massive theme right from the beginning of this book is the idea of belonging because Bone realises through questioning her own belonging and her own self-worth in a lot of ways that most of the Boatwright clan in one way or another, whether it's outward or not, have also been struggling with questioning their belonging for a very, very long time. And that's one of the amazing things that I will say just straight off the bat is that the Boatwright family felt so real to me. I felt like they were people that I knew that I had lived next to for years. I felt like I had seen their kids running about in the dark half clothed and I had seen them out on their soup drinking late into the night and playing loud music and generally raising hell and I felt like I was connected to these characters in a way that I haven't felt in a really long time in any kind of fiction. There is a very specific way that Dorothy Allison uses the history of this family where she layers politics upon politics upon politics. So even the people who desperately love and would fight to the death for each other still have serious problems with each other. They have grudges which date back to fathers and fathers and fathers three or four generations before. And 
that oral storytelling tradition where they repeat those grudges and they repeat their stories and they re repeat these long tales of these big arguments with he said, she said embroidery on them to suit the times is another massive theme. The idea of this sort of big rambling family and all their oral storytelling is very much a central part of this story and how Bone feels outside of that, how she feels like she can't construct her own story and she doesn't feel like she fits in anybody else's story so does she fit anywhere at all and if she doesn't is she worth trying to fit in? God that's sad, <laughs> that's so sad. Bone's story really starts to unfold when her mother meets a man who Bone and her little sister will later come to call Daddy Glenn. While the Boatwrights can really be considered a tribe in the area, Glenn comes from a little bit more money than that and has no family that he can really consider a tribe. It's him, a couple of brothers and a father who really doesn't like him all that much. So while attempting to court Bone's mother, Glenn is really charming and really, really persistent to the point where it starts to get pretty creepy because you can tell right from the start that he is incredibly covetous of the closeness of the Boatwright family. And because of the charm of Dorothy Allison's world, when you do kind of get glimpses into Bone's mother and how she's falling for Glenn, you can tell that it's because she is desperate to have anything for herself. She is so impoverished in all senses of that word that she is just desperate to have somebody who loves her. And Glenn has decided that he loves her. Whether he shows it or not is an entirely different story. And so when the inevitable happens, when Glenn decides that Bone and Bone's mother are too close and that she shouldn't be as close to her daughter, she should be closer to him, and the abuse with bone starts, you are in that weird state of being both thinking, yeah, well, that was kind of inevitable, I can kind of see Glenn's point, and then thinking, what the hell is wrong with me? But it's really weird, the sense that Dorothy Allison lulls you into. Although I will say, from the moment that the inevitable abuse finally happened, I had this really deep sense of foreboding and I think that that's I think that's how Mercy puts it in her review as well is that she has this feel of building terror from sort of the first the end of the first third of the novel through and that was one of the real impulses in continuing to read this book as quickly as I did because in a really weird way it was like I never really wanted to put the book down because I never really wanted to leave Bone alone. I always wanted to be there to witness what was happening to her if nobody else in her life would, which is a really like head screwy thing as a reader but it worked really really well as a device. Unfortunately I can't really tell you any more about the plot of this book because anything else would be a big stinky spoiler. So I'm going to talk about some of the other things that I loved and some of the other things that this book did. Because of the subject matter of this book, I have massively focused on the negative feelings. But in amongst all of those negative feelings, there is a lot of beauty in this book. There is a lot of beauty in the way that Dorothy Allison describes the landscape. Um, I'm not a big one for a lot of nature description and things like that but she describes it through Bone's eyes, the way that Bone sees her world. She has nothing physical to play with, she has no toys and so she makes everything outside an adventure and things that they drag out of the river become treasures and uh, things that they find by the side of the road and their actual physical environment of, you know, rushes by the river and trees and prairies and uh, just, it's just, it's, it's pretty beautiful. I was just amazed by how there I was all the time. I could taste the sweet iced tea being made in these huge batches. 
I could smell the sweat and the cigarette smoke and the bourbon. I could imagine the feel of the dirt between my toes as the kids played barefoot in the dirt yards. I vividly felt the texture of the things that the women grew in their gardens and of all the washing that they communally did and of all the plump baby skin that they were constantly holding on to with a baby at their hip. The way the senses in this novel are treated is, is, is a treat. It really is a treat. And I didn't know that it was happening. I think some literary fiction which heavily focuses on sense can feel a little bit contrived and like it's been laid on very thick but that did not happen in this book. So needless to say I gave this book 5 out of 5 stars and I really would recommend that if, if any of this at all sounded interesting to you that you pick it up and give it a go because it's unlike anything else that I have read either southern fiction or coming of age tale wise it is entirely unique and I can't wait to read it again. So I'm going to link below Mercedes original review for this one which of course inspired me to pick it up in the first place. Thank you girl, I love you. I will also link below a child poverty in the US documentary and a domestic abuse documentary, both by Real Stories, both available on YouTube and both of which contributed to my learning and my understanding of these issues and I think they're well worth a watch. So I hope that you guys enjoyed this review, the first review for my ABC challenge. I cannot believe it. I'm so glad to finally be kicking it off when I've been thinking about it for so long. And just so you know, the next book that I am going on to for my ABC challenge is Behind the Scenes at the Museum by Kate Atkinson, which is the next a on my list that I haven't read on my bookcase and it turns out I have quite a lot of A's so I decided that I would do two or three before I move on to B this time around. So I will hopefully report back very soon about that one. Bye!